Welcome back. Our final session deals with the final step in the breakthrough sequence, holding the gains. The fact that we have found a remedy does not assure that we will hold the gains. We saw an example in the piston ring company. The managers had driven the scrap from 14% down to 2%. Then, as the managers turned to other problems, the scrap began to rise. They had not provided fully for holding the gains. To hold the gains, we use the control process. It is a continuing process during which we evaluate our actual performance, compare this actual performance with a goal or standard, and take corrective action if we are out of control. Most control must be delegated to the operating forces, to supervisors and workers in the factories, offices, and so on. To enable these operating forces to hold the gains requires that we transfer the remedy from laboratory conditions to operating conditions and put the operating forces into a state of self-control. The problem of transfer arises because two sets of people are involved. First, the managers and engineers who guided the project and came up with the remedies. And second, the operating forces who will have the responsibility for using the remedies and holding the gains. In addition, two sets of conditions are involved. First, the remedy was worked out under conditions of uncertainty and experiment, whereas during operations, we want predictability. To get predictability requires that we provide the operating forces with a process which is capable of holding the gains establish operating standards and procedures to serve as a basis for training, control, and audit, and that we train the operating forces to use the procedures and meet the standards, and finally, establish systematic controls for detecting and correcting out-of-control variations. During the two journeys, we generate much new knowledge. It is this new knowledge which enables us to provide the capable process. The watch factory case involved minimal change. The machines were not changed, but the workers were provided with gauges which could guide the machines with greater precision. In contrast, the piston ring processes required extensive change in input materials, tools, process conditions, worker technique, and maintenance practice. Ideally, the changes should be designed to be irreversible. In the piston ring foundry, the manager provided the melters with large diameter spouts. He then destroyed the old spouts. No one could go back to use of small diameter spouts. In contrast, the manager provided scales to enable the melters to weigh the amount of metal to be poured. The melters soon stopped using the scales. They went back to estimating by eye and feel. What emerges is that the project is not complete until the remedy has been tested at two stages. Under the laboratory conditions during the project guidance and under operating conditions. The operating forces did not participate fully in those two journeys, in all those meetings and discussions. But they are more likely to hold the gains if the acquired new knowledge is transferred to them. One method of transfer is through preparing new operating standards and procedures. Once prepared, these can be used to train the operating forces, to establish the control system, and to serve as a basis for audits. Usually the procedures are clear with respect to essential technology, the input materials, tools, instruments, process settings. The vague aspects of the procedures usually relate to matters such as aesthetic qualities, equipment maintenance, worker technique. In due course, any such weaknesses 
will show up as failures to hold the gains. Holding the gains can be aided further by training the operating forces with respect to just what has changed. What are the new standards to be met? What new decisions and actions are required from the operating forces? Who is responsible for making these decisions and taking these actions? How to use the new technology? Which techniques have given the best results? And what are the consequences of deviating from the specified standards and procedures? During this training, we should provide the operating forces with the insights turned up during the two journeys. In the watch factory, the original study of process capability was shown and explained to all lathe operators. In the piston ring company, the Melter Knight was assigned to do some of the training since his techniques had been part of the solution. A good transition to the operating forces, while necessary, is not sufficient to hold the gains. As time goes on, there arise many threats to continued good performance. Equipment deteriorates. Input materials are discovered to be deficient. Human workers make mistakes. Because of such threats, managers do not just walk away after the transition. They provide a systematic means for holding the gains, something called control. The subject of control is quite broad. We will divide the subject based on the time of exercising control. Control prior to operations, control during operations, and control after operations. Our secondary division of the subject will be based on who takes the actions which are critical. In our sessions on the remedial journey, we looked at many ways of establishing control prior to operations. For example, early warning systems, qualification systems, systematic analyses, foolproofing. There's no need to review these. Instead, let's look at systems for control during operations. Control during operations is through the feedback loop. It is a cyclical activity. It consists of evaluation of actual performance, comparison of this actual with the standard, and action on the difference. These activities are interrelated. Here is a model of the feedback loop. The feedback loop consists of several elements. A standard, in this case the quality specification. A sensor to evaluate actual performance, in this case the inspector. A collator to compare actual to standard, in this case the quality report. When actual differs from standard by more than the predetermined tolerance, the loop is closed. This energizes the effectors to take action, in this case, the managers, supervisors, and engineers. Design of the feedback loop depends mainly on how the loop is to be closed, that is, who or what will take action on the difference. Let's start with the automated loop, the servo mechanism. An example is a servo mechanism for control of thickness of cheats. The sensor is a beta ray gauge. It measures the thickness of the emerging sheet zone by zone. If thickness for any zone exceeds the tolerance, an effector circuit is energized. It takes corrective action by changing the process temperature for that zone. Once the automated loop has been correctly set up, it makes no errors, whether due to inattention, lack of technique, or willfulness. However, human intervention is still needed a formal maintenance schedule must be set up and adhered to rigidly. Much of the control during operations is carried out by the workforce. An example is setup verification, also called setup control. During startup of a process, the first few pieces are checked for conformance to specification before the batch may be run off. This setup verification is made by some combination of setup technician, production worker, and inspector. Most of the control carried out by the workforce is process control or running control. 
It is an essential part of continuing processes. The purpose is to decide whether the process should continue to run or whether it should stop. During process control, the workforce may act in several capacities within the feedback loop. The worker may act as a sensor to evaluate what is the actual quality being produced, as a collator to compare actual quality to specification, and as an effector to regulate the process so as to bring it into conformance. Let's recall that confusion over who is responsible for quality. We examined that confusion in an earlier session. We found that no answer is possible until we restate the question in terms of decisions and actions. Those decisions and actions correspond to specific functions of the feedback loop. Every year we have myriads of cases in which actual quality differs from standard. Our managers cannot get involved with such myriads of cases other than the vital few. What the managers can do is to establish rules for decision making, rules which cover responsibility, who may take which action, criteria for decision making, which actions to take under what conditions, and procedures, for example, for physical disposition of product, for documentation. Once such rules have been devised, it becomes feasible to train the workforce to make most of the decisions. The vital few controls are not delegated. They are reserved to the managers and supervisors. These reserved controls are exercised in several ways. First, direct authority. For example, requisitions to draw material from stores may require approval of some supervisor. Second, direct supervision. The supervisor personally monitors important actions of the workforce on a scheduled basis. Next, audits. We saw an example during the piston ring project. And finally, reports on performance. These enable managers to evaluate recent performance, observe trends, and identify needs for managerial action. Holding the gains requires also that we detect out-of-control conditions and take corrective action. For some out-of-control conditions, detection is no problem. The crisis is only too obvious. Other cases are not so obvious. To detect them requires special reports, audits, and so on. In addition, there's need to distinguish real out-of-control situations from the false alarms. We can discuss this problem with the help of the quincunx, our pinball machine. Quincunx, please reappear. Thank you. Let's set the funnel at 13 and start to make product. Then, to maintain control, we will test a sample of four units hourly. Here's the first one. That's 13. Again. Again. 14. Total is 53. And the average is 13.2. An hour later, we sample again. Ten, eleven, eleven, and twelve. Total is 44, the average is 11. And the third time. 10, 11, 11, and 13. Total is 45, and the average is 11.2. 
we continue this hour after hour. Time really flies here. We see that the averages are not all alike. But let's plot these now. 13, 14, 15, 12, 11. Our first one was 13.2, second was 11, third was 11.2. They do stay fairly close to the expected value of 13. Now suppose someone has charted these test results for many hours. The chart might look like this. Most of the points are quite close to 13. Their variation is similar to the variation we obtained from the quincunx when the funnel setting remained constant at 13. We call these random or chance variations. They could easily be the result of chance or luck. From those points, there's no evidence of any change in the funnel setting. But notice the points marked A and B. They are much further from the expected value of 13 than any other points. We could reasonably conclude points A and B are not the result of chance. There must have been some real change in the process. What about the points C and D? Are they the result of chance? Or are they the result of a change in the process? It would be convenient if we had some tools to help us separate the false alarms from the real thing. We do have such tools. They are called tests of statistical significance. In our chart of product made by the quincunx, the average value is 13. I have computed the scatter of individual units by computing sigma. It came out equal to 2.1. Also, I have found that the data exhibit the symmetry of the familiar bell-shaped distribution curve. From all this information, we can proceed to establish boundary lines for separating random variations from those caused by process changes. We can calculate these boundary lines from the laws of probability once we have agreed on the odds. For example, suppose we set the odds at 1 in 20 we would then calculate boundary lines around the expected value of 13 in such a way that if the process had not changed, then 95% of the points on the chart would fall within those boundary lines. Now let's look at the bell-shaped curve. The horizontal scale is product measurements. The vertical scale is frequency of those measurements. Our statistical tables tell us that 95% of the data are contained within the zone of plus and minus two sigmas around the average. The value of sigma for the quincunx is 2.1, but this applies to samples of one unit each. For larger samples, there's a formula. Sigma of the average is equal to sigma of the individuals divided by the square root of n, where n is the sample size. For our sample size of four units, sigma of the averages figures out to 1.05. Hence, two sigmas equals 2.1. To get our boundary lines, we compute 13 plus and minus 2.1. 13 plus 2.1 is equal to 15.1. And 13 minus 2.1 is equal to 10.9. Now let's add these boundary lines to the chart. The points A and B are well outside the boundary lines, so we infer that they are due to real process changes. The points C and D could have arisen from chance alone, so we do not infer that the process had changed. 
In this form, the chart is a continuing test of statistical significance. It is called the Schuhart Control Chart after its inventor, Dr. W. A. Schuhart. The boundary lines are called limit lines. Quincunks, again, many thanks. You have been most helpful. Once we discover we are losing the gains due to some adverse change, we should take steps to restore the status quo. We call this troubleshooting, also firefighting, corrective action, and so on. Troubleshooting is diagnosis and remedial action as applied to sporadic troubles, not chronic troubles. In troubleshooting, as in breakthrough, we must make the two journeys, diagnostic and remedial. But each is simpler for sporadic troubles. In troubleshooting, the purpose of the diagnostic journey is to answer the question, what was the adverse change? Later, the purpose of the remedial journey is to remove the adverse change and restore the status quo. In troubleshooting, the tools for diagnosis are virtually identical with those we studied in earlier sessions. Troubleshooters should be trained in these tools of diagnosis. Troubleshooting also involves a shift in emphasis. To answer the question, what was the adverse change, we need to concentrate on identifying the changes which did take place and discovering which of these changes did the damage. There's also a shift of emphasis during the remedial journey. In troubleshooting, the normal remedy is to go back to the old ways. This involves minimal creativity and minimal cultural resistance. However, we should also be alert for ways to avoid repetition of the sporadic trouble by making some basic change. Such a basic change does involve the kinds of diagnosis and remedy needed for chronic troubles with all the associated creativity and cultural resistance. We have reached the end of our series of sessions. So, we will make two summations. First, the usual high points of the present session, and finally, a look back at the road we have traveled together. First, the high points of session 16. To hold the gains requires that we make the transition to operating conditions, provide a capable process, establish standards and procedures, train the operating forces, establish a system of controls. Control can be achieved prior to operations through making changes irreversible or through foolproofing. Control during operations is through the feedback loop. The feedback loop can be closed by automated processes, by the workforce, by supervisors, or by managers. Delegation of control to the workforce requires rules for decision making, definition of responsibilities, criteria to be met, and procedures to be followed. Managerial control may be exercised through direct authority, direct supervision, audits, or through reports. Holding the gains requires skills in troubleshooting. Detection of change is aided by data on trends. Statistical tools can help distinguish true adverse changes from false alarms. Troubleshooting employs many of the same diagnostic tools as are used during quality improvement. Troubleshooters should be trained in use of these diagnostic tools. Between now and your next team meeting, look back at prior projects to see how your company has provided for holding the gains. What are your conclusions? For your present project, design a system of controls appropriate for holding the gains. For our final summation, let's look again at those diverging lines. We use this model as evidence in support of the objective of our program. That objective is to develop the habit of making annual improvements in quality and annual reductions in quality-related costs. We can generalize the model as follows. Each one of us 
can identify some real life situation which fits the model. Company X may have been founded on some patented product or process. The resulting monopoly enabled the company to increase sales and profits year after year with the outward appearance of all's well. Enter Company Y, a small determined competitor. Company Y launched a long-range improvement program. Year after year, the gap narrowed until it closed. Belatedly, the alarm bells began ringing in Company X. A time of troubles beset Company X, and it would take years to recover. Meanwhile, those two lines would keep on diverging. The lesson is clear. For the short run, the company may be able to get by without annual improvement, but not for the long run. Without annual improvement, there may be no long run. Since annual improvement is a must for the company, it is also a must for the managers. But we have seen that managers will not make annual improvements unless they accept responsibility for making improvements and acquire training in the tools needed to make improvements. It is different with control. All managers accept responsibility for control. All are well experienced in control, and many are well trained in the tools for control. What we need is a corresponding level of responsibility, experience, and training in improvement. The career manager, the professional manager, should become equally proficient whether engaged in control or in improvement. Is there ever any end to improvement? Evidently not. The need never ends. There's a continuing procession of new problems coming at us from over the horizon. Also, we have never seen any limit to human ingenuity or creativity. We may be sure that once we acquire the habit of annual improvement, we will never lack for opportunities to exercise that habit. Goodbye and good luck.